And I just want I'd, I'd just like to say again, again, to those of you that recently joined us, thank you very much for your support and being with us uh, again for our coffee morning this morning. Um, my name's Helen Ellitson. It's my privilege to be the uh, Curator of Research and Development at the William Morris Society. And as many of you know by now who are regulars at these talks, we started these at the beginning of this year to really try and highlight the um, varied and beautiful collections that the William Morris Society have. And the, the Society was actually founded in 1955 to promote the life and work of this extraordinary man. And it's been interesting for me to put together this talk because it's a little bit different from the, the other talks I've given. Usually we highlight one particular example usually in our monthly coffee mornings uh, but this one has been quite different in that I've put examples of nearly all the different types of objects we have in our collection into this one talk um, because obviously celebrating Morris and Company and they covered basically all aspects of interior design uh, and because it's been um, it, because I've put together a potted history of the company, it's been a slight challenge to actually get it into our half hour coffee morning today. So please bear with me if I go slightly uh, over time, but hopefully not very much over. Um, and as usual, there's please type into the chat function if anybody has any comments during the talk or um, and also at the end of the talk, um, there'll be time for questions. So again, please type into the chat function any questions and then at the end, I'll do my best uh, to answer those. So um, we'll, we'll, make, we'll make a start. So and I'll turn, my, I'll turn my camera off as well to help with the, uh, the bandwidth and I'll turn that back on at the end. In celebration of the 160th anniversary of Morris and Company, this month's talk will explore the fascinating history of the firm. From its foundation in 1861 as Morris, Marshall, Faulkner and Company, its reconstitution to just Morris and Company in 1875, to its voluntary liquidation in 1940, the the company produced a remarkable range of products designed by some of the leading artists of the day. And this morning, we'll look at the beautiful products manufactured by the company that are in the society's collection, ranging from wallpapers and textiles to furniture and stained glass. We'll then move on to cover the acquisition of Morrison Company by Sanderson's and the changing fortunes of the Morris brand in the 20th century, up to the present day resurgence in popularity that has seen Morris become a highly successful household name again. From July 1860, Morris's friends, Edward and Georgiana Byrne Jones, the Maddox Browns, Rossetti and Lizzie, and occasionally Charles Faulkner and Cornell Price, helped Morris and his wife Jane to decorate Red House, Morris and Jane's first married home. And it was the collaborative decoration of Red House that led to the formation of Morris's firm, which was really almost a crusade against the current state of the decorative arts in England. As Morris said himself, all of the minor arts were in a state of complete degradation, especially in England. And accordingly, in 1861, with the conceited courage of a young man, I set myself to reforming all that. Accordingly, Morris Marshall Faulkner and Company was established in April 1861 by Morris himself, the architect Philip Webb, who had designed Webb, uh, Red House for him, the artists Edward Byrne Jones, Dante Gabriel Rossetti and Ford Maddox Brown, the engineer and, and amateur artist Peter Paul Marshall and the mathematician Charles Faulkner. Largely financed by Morris himself, Morris also provided much of the creative motivation and energy for the new business. For Morris, the firm was his full-time employment and he was essentially the managing director of the company that became informally known as The Firm. Stained glass was one of the first products manufactured by the firm in the founding year. 
Morris was responsible for the overall colour scheme and later the leading as well. And he supervised all stages of execution. The various artists drew their designs called cartoons and submitted these to the stained glass painters. The first stained glass windows were produced for All Saints Selsey in Gloucestershire, followed by several of Bodley's churches, St. Mark, St. Michael at All Angels in Brighton and St. Martin's in Scarborough. The Society has this design by Burne Jones for St. Radegunda, part of the magnificent east window of another Bodley church, All Saints in Cambridge. And this was the subject of a, a recent talk we gave, so that's available again on our YouTube channel. And the only actual example of stained glass in the Society's collection are these, uh, the Philip Webb designed glass for the studio home of the artist John Rodham Spencer Stanhope from 1861. Again, this is a subject of another of our YouTube recordings, another coffee morning talk, so I won't go into detail here. Morris grew increasingly concerned about the compatibility though of his windows being installed in medieval buildings. And so from 1877, announced that the company's windows would no longer be placed in medieval churches. And this coincided with Morris's founding of the Society of the Protection of Ancient Buildings. As Ray Watkinson, the Morris scholar said, the legacy of the firm's early stained glass remained an inspiration to the arts and crafts movement. Morris and his circle had been at the center of transforming the role of the artist craftsman and the stained glass they provided amply demonstrated the feasibility of building on a tradition inectably associated with the Middle Ages. Um, tiles were another important early product of the firm. The women of the company were employed to paint Dutch earthenware blanks and several members of the firm produced designs, as did the ceramic artist William de Morgan. The society has a small number of tiles, including this beautiful hand-painted daisy tile. By the early 1860s, the firm was seen as an exciting new interior design company, and a steady flow of commissions for house decoration came in including the decoration of Spencer Stanhope's Sandroid, as I've already mentioned. Morris believed that his duty was to revive a sense of beauty in home life, to restore the dignity of art to ordinary household decoration. This can certainly be seen in one of Morris and Company's grandest private commissions in the furnishing and decoration of one Holland Park. For eight years in the 1880s, the company was involved in an array of decorations for this home, from tapestries and carpets to paintings and wallpapers. This is the society's only example from this scheme for the ceiling of the drawing room, which was quoted as costing in the region of 160 pounds. And as well as private commissions, the decoration of public spaces proved popular. The two most important early commissions which really established the reputation of the firm were the decoration of the armory and tapestry rooms at St James's Palace and the decoration of the green dining room at the South Kensington Museum, now the V&A. Sometimes this is known as the Morris Room and is now part of the set of three cafes. The Society is fortunate to have several designs in its collection for the decoration of the former. And here we can see the extent of the decoration for St. James's Palace, from repeating patterns of clock cases like we have here, to, to the decoration of ceilings and cornices, all of which was approved by Queen Victoria herself. The painting of the ambassador's entrance cost £657, and the decoration of all the entrances at St. James's Palace was on the, in getting onto the region of 5,000 pounds. And moving on to wallpaper. Wallpapers one of, were one of the first products offered by Morris and Company. Although Morris's attempts to print his first three repeating wallpaper designs, daisy, trellis and fruit, using oil colors on etched zinc plates 
were not a success. The results were inconsistent. So Morris then um, had conventional woodblocks hand cut by Barrett and Company. And in 1864, he approached the established wallpaper manufacturer, Jeffrey and Co of Islington to hand print his papers. Jeffreys were a long established firm that printed wallpapers for some of the leading artists of the day, such as Owen Jones. The logbooks are now in the Sanderson Art Design Archive, as we'll hear more about shortly. The process of block printing started with the design meticulously engraved onto the surface of a rectangular deal block on which was mounted a layer of fine grained wood, fruit trees such as cherry and pear offering the right balance between durability and relative ease of carving the design. Those areas not required to print were cut away. And multicolored patterns required a separately carved block for every pigment in the finished design. The carved surface was inked with paint in a blanket lined tray and then lowered face down onto the paper for printing. Pitch pins on the corners of the blocks helped the printer to line up the design precisely. Each colour was printed separately along the length of the roll, which was then festooned, hung up to dry before the next block of a different colour could be applied. The process was laborious and required great skill and precision. A single 30 block roll of wallpaper could take up to four weeks to complete. The Society has a comprehensive collection of Morris wallpapers, including the first three produced, trellis, uh, with the birds of which were designed by Philip Webb, uh, daisy and fruit. We're also fortunate to have several designs for wallpapers which are always fascinating to compare alongside their printed finished wallpapers, such as the Grafton design. So here we have on the left, our original watercolor drawing by Morris for Grafton, and on the right, the actual finished wallpaper. Um, and I think it's always interesting to see the differences. So as you can see on the left, we've got a dotted background um, and, that would have been achieved by hammering pins into the surface of the wood block, so the dots would have appeared on the background. But for some reason, uh, we'll probably never know why, Morris decided not to have a dotted background in the finished paper. So Grafton actually appeared without the, the spotting in the background. So moving on to wallpaper, I'm sorry, moving on to furniture, the company provided a whole range from chairs and tables to wardrobes and cupboards. Morris believed that furniture should be well made, solid, and without unnecessary ornamentation. He and his friends had experience of making furniture prior to founding the firm, which included the Prioress's Tail wardrobe given as a wedding present to Morris and Jane. It can be seen here on the far left of this photograph of Morris's first floor drawing room of Kelmscott House in Hammersmith where the society uh, is based. The photograph also shows example from Morris and Company, such as the Philip Webb designed adjustable back chair um, on the left hand side in the left corner there in the foreground. And the settle on the right hand side of the image. And that was originally made for Red House and Morris brought it with him when he moved and then um, it ended up at Kelmscott House. Um, but it's now um, moved to Kelmscott Manor when um, obviously Morris died and the contents of Kelmscott House um, were, were dis was disbanded to various places. The settle has a painted and lacquered leather panels with a sunflower design. And examples of the same settle were later available in, in the firm's catalogue, costing £35. The simple and elegant Rush seated chair of ebonized beech is a classic Morris and Company product. And Morris, as well as other members of the company, are known to have furnished their own homes with them. Here is a Sussex chair on the left hand side at the bottom corner of the image um, in, from Morris's dining room, again at Kelmscott House in Hammersmith. 
The Society has a number of Sussex chairs in its collection, including the round seated version I've just showed, a corner chair and armchairs. The armchair um, was designed by Philip Webb and as shown in the firm's furniture catalogue, was available at seven shillings. They were extremely popular and were copied by other companies such as Liberties later. Now we're going on to textiles, starting with printed cottons. Morris worked with Thomas Wardle of Leak in Staffordshire to resurrect the almost lost art of textile printing with plant and vegetable dyes. Block printing of fabrics was undertaken on long padded tables running the length of the workshops. Designs were carved on a series of fruit wood blocks, one for each colour used, and the process was similar to the block printing of rolls of wallpaper. The die pad trays were mounted on trolleys which could be pulled along the length of the table. The inked blocked block pressed down onto the cloth using a lead weighted mallet. And later the wooden blocks were modified with metal inserts padded with felt to hold the die. We have several block printed cottons in our collection, including the ever popular Strawberry Thief and the striking honeysuckle design. Morris then started experiments with weaving setting up a small loom in his ground floor bedroom at Kelmscott House. In his diary, Morris records that over the summer of 1879, he rose early every morning to put in a few hours weaving practice before breakfast. And over that single summer, the diary records that he spent 180 hours weaving his very first tapestry, a canthus and vine. He actually nicknamed it cabbage and vine. He was quite critical of his own work and thought the acanthus leaves look a bit more like cabbage leaves. And uh, that's now at Kelmscott Manor. Embroideries were another important product of the firm's production and have a close connection with May Morris. May was Morris's younger daughter and was extremely talented at designing and making embroideries. Morris recognised his daughter's skills and she became the manager of the company's embroidery department when she was just 23 years old. We have several embroideries in our collection, including this stunning orange tree by May Morris herself. Regarding woven textiles, we hold examples such as the charming bird woven wool of 1878, designed especially by Morris for his drawing room, again at Helmscott House. And then moving on to floor coverings. This is the only design for linoleum produced by the company. The Morrison Company catalogue refers to two colourways of this design, but this green and yellow version of almost an African marigold pattern is the only known design, an only known colourway uh, I've been able to track down. So if anybody's ever seen this um, lino in, an, in the other colour, I'd be really interested um, in hearing about it. There are now examples of Morris's lino are very rare. Um, and as we can see, the original name was the Cortesine floor cloth. Again, keeping on the theme of floor coverings, the Society has two versions of the beautiful Hammersmith carpets, named after the location of their first workshop in the coach house of Kelmscott House, Hammersmith. Even after workshops moved to larger premises at Merton Abbey in 1881, when big orders came in for larger carpets and they had to expand and move to larger premises, the rugs and carpets were still known as Hammersmith carpets, but they no longer had the symbol of the hammer motif woven into the corner. And um, hopefully you can see our, on our example here, the bottom right hand side, the hammer and an M for Morris. Some examples have wavy lines as well to signify the nearby River Thames in Hammersmith. And is, it was at Merton Abbey as well that the company housed their dyeing workshops with silk and woolen fabrics, as well as tapestry weaving. And although we don't have any examples of ta full tapestries in our collection, 
we do have these intriguing platinum prints of the Search for the Holy Grail tapestries. These prints in their original Morris and Company frames will be the subject of one of our coffee mornings next year. Morris was far from an employer who sat in an office. He took an active part in all aspects of the firm's work and never gave his employees anything to do which he wasn't willing to do himself. May Morris described her father's in-depth involvement in the company saying, he was in a direct relation with the silk weavers and carpet weavers, dyers and blockers, with pattern makers and block cutters, with cabinet makers and carvers in wood, with glass painters, kiln men and labourers, and with his wallpaper printers. From the beginning of the firm, Morris had a direct relationship with the general public. Whilst in the shop and showroom attached to the workshops, first in Red Lion Square and then in Queen Square before the move to Oxford Street, one visitor to the firm's shop recalled being surprised that Morris, as owner, served her himself, wrapping up her two glass tumblers in paper. So Morris went on to produce um, a, a huge amount of designs for printed cottons, woven fabrics, designs for wallpapers, as well as carpets, rugs, embroideries and tapestries. The 1870s and 80s were Morris's most productive period of designing. Um, and he wrote to his friend, Aglaia Coronio, I am drawing patterns so fast. Last night, I dreamed I had to draw sausage. Somehow I had to eat it first, which made me anxious about my digestion. However, I've just done a quite a pretty pattern for printed work. It was during this time of enormous creative output that the firm was reconstituted under Morris's sole proprietorship in 1875, becoming the famous Morris and Company that we know so well. Morris and Company was to survive the loss of Morris, but his death meant substantial change. In 1905, the company was renamed Morris and Company Directors Limited. The exceptionally talented John Henry Durrell who had started as an apprentice with the company, became artistic director. And Henry Curry Marillier, former occupant of Kelmscott House after Morris's death and an expert on the history of tapestry, became managing director. However, the board of directors were businessmen without artistic backgrounds or training, and the company was now trading at a loss. Morris's designs continue to be produced. Several of them were modified to suit changing tastes and new products appeared such as furniture with a mixture of styles, which Morris probably would have approved, disapproved. However, this change temporarily revived the fortunes of the company until the First World War, when the majority of the workforce joined up. This meant that little new work was produced. 1917 saw the company move to new premises at 17 George Street, Hanover Square, and the range of services increased to offer restoration, reupholstery, and textile cleaning. In 1925, the company changed name again to Morris and Company Art Workers Limited, and the firm's range of products expanded to include items such as studio pottery. However, a sales slump after the war felt across the UK and overseas affected the firm's fortunes, despite the increase in the range of items sold, and despite the fact that Durrell had been able to recruit the old Merton Abbey employees when they returned from active service. Durrell died in 1932, having worked at Morrison Company for a total of 54 years. His death had a serious impact on the firm losing both a talented designer and a last direct link with Morris. Although Dell's son Duncan took over the management, he was unable to restore the firm's fortunes and survive in a competitive market. The firm had never really recovered from the effect of war. And on March the 21st, 1940, Marillier was forced to put the firm into voluntary liquidation. It was then that Arthur Sanderson and Sons became involved in our story. Morris had no dealings with Sanderson's during his own lifetime, 
but they were a well-established firm founded in 1860. As we've already seen, Jeffrey and Company printed Morris and Company wallpapers since they were first designed back in 1864. In 1927, Sanderson had taken over the Jeffrey and Company wallpaper production. And this connection with Morris and Company made them an obvious successor. And they went on to purchase Morris and Company from the receiver on the 24th of May, 1940, for a total of 400 pounds. The purchase included the contents of the George Street showroom, printing blocks, log books, stock and fabric samples. It took several years before Sanderson's began printing Morris's wallpapers again, as they were then seen as distinctly old fashioned. And it was also due though to a temporary, to a shortage of materials caused by the war. But they began appearing, appearing in small numbers from the 1950s. However, it was the 1960s that saw a resurgence of interest in Morrison patterns when Sanderson issued a range of recolored designs ah. in, <laughs> in purple. Uh, here we have acorn, um, orange, uh, Indian, bright pink, sunflower, and turquoise, and the vivid hues of bird and an enemy. The 1960s fashion revolution saw a resurgence in popularity in Victoriana, combined with psychedelic and flamboyant colors we see here. The epitome of the psychedelic style of the era was George Harrison wearing his Morris and Company golden lily jacket from 1966. This was one of several Morris and Company patterns made into clothing by the fashionable Chelsea boutique, Granny Takes a Trip. Another one of the Beatles, John Lennon, had the same Morris and Company jacket in the chrysanthemum pattern. And it was also available in the Brother Rabbit and Bachelor's Button designs. It went on to be featured on one of the Royal Mail's Great British Fashion Stamps showcasing the beauty of John Henry Dull's original 1897 Golden Lily wallpaper. As, as well as altering the colours, the patterns were rescaled, and this proved instrumental in re-establishing the Morris & Company brand to a completely new generation. Sanderson's began advertising in our own William Morris Society's journals, and in the 1970s, a new Morris collection was launched, which saw Golden Lily reach sales in excess of 5,000 meters a month. It was the version in brown and orange that was the most popular, as seen here in the advert showing Diana Rigg in a room set showcasing Golden Lily everywhere from the sofa to the curtains. The 1980s saw a return to more authentic colorways and scales which proved extremely successful. The most popular of all the Morrison Company designs um, in, Morrison, in Sanderson's opinions was Willow Bow, which has never been out of production since it was first designed by Morris in 1877. Sanderson's Morrison Company brand have collaborated with famous fashion brands in recent years, including a partnership between Morrison Company and H&M, in 2018. The development of this clothing range took one year between conception and production. Morris and Company's creative director, Claire Vallis, said, the patterns that we are comfortable surrounding ourselves in at home have the same appeal as the clothes we like to wear, she said. In the UK especially, Morris's patterns are almost like a subconscious part of our design psyche. Many of us grew up with his patterns without realising it, she said. And here we have a very pre-Raphaelite looking lady wearing uh, the Morrison Company Pimpernel design. In celebration of their 160th year, Morrison Company this year collaborated uh, this summer with Next on a collection for the whole family. The Next press release stated that this range explores the enduring appeal of iconic William Morris prints. Speaking about this new collection, 
the creative director Morris and Co said, Morris and Company's iconic designs have truly stood the test of time, experiencing an enduring appeal which has continued for 160 years. The joy has been in bringing the brand to new audiences. And this actual design that we have here um, is called Bell Flowers. And Morris actually designed this uh, for a carpet. It's now possible to, to buy Morris prints um, everywhere, from cushions to coasters, from toiletries to t-shirts. And I imagine many of us here this morning have at least one item of Morris and Company in our homes in one form or another. But regarding Morris and Company's own collections, two of the latest show a huge contrast in colorings, which I thought it'd be interesting just to quickly um, end our coffee morning with. This is the pure Morris North range, and this has reworked Morris's patterns to reflect the colors of the Nordic region. And it's said to have been inspired by the diaries of William Morris's 1871 expedition to Iceland. And here we have um, some more designs here. As you can see, they're very um, minimalist in, in the colouring. But in complete contrast, we have the Ben Pentreath Queen Square collection. Ben Trent Pentreath was an is an architectural interior, interior designer. And he collaborated with Morris and Company recently to create a collection of new colourings of iconic patterns for the autumn winter 2020 range. The Queen Square collection is named after the road that housed the first Morris and Company factory and showroom. Featuring original designs across 18 fabrics and wallpapers, Ben Pentry said of his Queen Square collection, it fills us with a nostalgic familiarity. I've loved the William Morris archive for as long as I can remember. But one of the recurring themes for me is the beautiful colourways developed by Sanderson in the 1960s. If, like me, you're old enough to remember everyone's houses in the 70s and early 80s, decorated with seagrass squares on the floor and William Morris on the walls and the sofa, you'll understand the deep nostalgia and sense of a slightly simpler time that these patterns evoke. Ben went on to say he thinks there's a sense of comfort and happiness in the fabrics and patterns that he thinks couldn't be more relevant today. He said, I find it extraordinary that Morris and Company patterns developed in the mid to late 19th century are still as fresh and relevant 160 years later as they were then. Morris was a master of pattern and repeat, and I find his patterns unequaled in the simultaneous simplicity and richness. Some of these designs have been remade with completely new colour combinations chosen by Ben Pentreath, as we can see here. And the Morris and Company brand is now a significant international brand highlighting the resilience and reputation of Morris's craftsmanship and skill. As Ben Pentreath recently said, it's about finding pleasure in the simple things. These iconic patterns showcase the longevity and enduring appeal of expertly crafted design. And Ben Pentreath said that willow bough was one of the most beautiful patterns he, and fabrics he knew. I therefore thought it would be a fitting conclusion to this morning's talk to show the changing nature of this one single classic Morris pattern one of the most popular of all Morris's designs. From the original colourway in the Society's collection on the left to the minimalist version on the right from the new Morris and Company Pure range to the return to the 60s vivid colours of the current Morris and Company Queen Square collection in the background here, Willow Bow remains hugely popular, whatever the colour. From the extraordinary vision of one man back in 1861, we have a truly beautiful series of designs still in production to this day. Morris and Company has had a lasting legacy that is part of our everyday culture 
and remains enduringly appealing. It is surely still the case now that when we remind ourselves of Morris's own words that are still relevant to today, when he said, my work is the embodiment of dreams. So thank you for joining us this morning to celebrate the special anniversary of this fascinating company. And if people um, have um, any questions, please do um, type them into the chat um, and I'll do or any, or any comments and uh, uh, and I'll do my best to help as uh, as I imagine this the, the colorways and the changing fashions might have generated a few uh, a few comments uh, among amongst you watching this morning. Uh, so please do if you if anybody wants to uh, to, to, to put anything in, in the chat, um, do feel free to do so. Um, and thanks ever so much for uh, for your for your comments as well. I'm so pleased people um, enjoy these coffee mornings. It's certainly been a privilege for me to put them together. Uh, but as I said, this was one of the more challenging to fit into our half hour coffee break. Um, somebody's actually asked, um, what's at Merton Abbey now? Um, Merton Abbey, it, there's unfortunately that there's not quite so much left of the Morrison Company workshops. Um, well, very little really. There's um, a very large Sainsbury's super, super supermarket um, on the main site uh, where they, where it was, and on the banks of the River Wandle that the Morrison Company fabrics were washed through, washed out in, and then left to dry in the banks there to dry naturally in the sun. There's a little plaque that said this was the site of the Morrison Company workshops. But there's some, um, you can still see some remains and also the, the Liberty workshops that were also there at the site. Um, you can still see um, uh, the mill, the Liberty mill, um, and also the, there are craft markets nearby. And in the mill, there's a display of Morrison Company's work as well. So there are reminders of, of Morrison Company's time at Merton Abbey, but uh, unfortunately not nothing uh, as was there in Morris's own day. Uh, there are other things to see though nearby. I think it's St Mary's Church at Merton Abbey that um, has Morris of windows in it as well. So that's always interesting to see if you do go to, uh, to Merton. Um, or oh, somebody said there were a few surprises there. <laughs> um, and somebody's asked, um, Somebody's like uh, likes they like the the white background of the of the fruit and daisy patterns, um, which is more popular. Uh, was it originally blue? Um, we actually it, there was a pale blue background in our society. We have several colorways, as the majority of Morris's patterns um, were made. They were made in several different colorways. And in our own collection, we have willow bow, as we have with other wallpapers, in several colorways. So the pale blue was actually one of the original colorways. It's more commonly seen in the slide in this slide here on um, in this pale like cream background. But blue was at, pale blue was actually an original colorway as well, surprisingly. Um, somebody said they're going to refrain from commenting on the modern colorways. <laughs> I deliberately obviously didn't comment on that. Um, um, and somebody's uh, commented about, you know, designers changing, changing the colorways, changing the scales. Um, so, um, yeah, I think some of the, um, you know, some of the some of the more modern um, slides I've shown might have been might be a bit more controversial. <laughs> um, but as I, as I finished um, saying, I think I think one thing above all to remember is that um, Morris, Morris's patterns, Morris and Company is still going, the patterns are still there, and it really shows Morris's, a testament really to Morris's design skills. People still want to buy these patterns and uh, they're still as popular as ever, and they're more, they're more widely available now. Uh, whether you agree with it or not, they're, they're everywhere in all sorts of um, um, media to buy, in all sorts of products. So, um, and I think, um, I think we've probably reached the end of our comments now um, and questions. But uh, again, just to say a huge thank you to everybody again for joining us. Um, it's really lovely to see everybody in our in our coffee mornings. And we just to say about future events, 
we won't be having a one of our coffee morning talks next month because it it would fall our third Tuesday would fall in, in Christmas week which I imagine people will be very busy um, so we're not going to do a December talk so we'll be back again in January for our coffee morning talk uh, but also just to say I think Pamela Smith is joining us this morning uh, uh, it's lovely to see you Pamela and she's actually we're very fortunate to be um, able to have a talk from Pamela uh, and that's actually the subject of our next event on the on the 4th of December the arts and crafts uh, Russian connection uh, will be our next event so hello Pamela we're really looking forward to your your lecture uh, that's going to be fascinating um, to uh, to learn more about the Russian arts and crafts movement so thank you so much for um, going to give that talk for us next month and I think that's, uh, I think we've covered everything. I think hopefully we've gone through everybody's messages and, and questions. So again, a huge thank you for joining us again and all your support. And we shall look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you very much.